Uh, praise the name of the Lord. Amen. I am delighted and grateful for this opportunity to fellowship with you, dear brothers and sisters. Um, thank you, Pastor, for thank you, my colleague pastors, for this opportunity to minister in this great church. And uh, we praise God for this opportunity. I didn't come from very far away, just around here. And uh, I am grateful for this opportunity. I invite us to share the word of God from the book of Acts chapter 8. And we are reading from verse 26 to 40. Acts chapter 26, verse 26 to 40. The Bible says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, who had charge of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamp before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this of himself? or of some other man. Then Philip opened his, opened his mouth and began, beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Shall we pray? Loving Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this privilege to be in your house of prayer, house of prayer for all nations, those of us who are here physically and the many of your children who are also in worship together with us virtually. We thank you for the portion of the scripture that is before us for consideration. We pray that as we delve into this passage, that the Holy Spirit, who guided its writing, who ensured that its record is put down for the many of us that will come to live later, that he will bring us to its understanding. Speak to us, dear Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. The title of our sermon is From Jerusalem to Gaza. From Jerusalem to Gaza. I was sharing with my elder sitting next to me. Uh, he said, Pastor, that is an interesting topic, especially going by the circumstances of the moment. Uh, because of what is happening 
in the Middle East. Uh, yes, it is a very interesting topic, and uh, I welcome us to consider it together. Uh, before we come into that word, allow me to share with you a story uh, from Steve J. Cole's dissertation on how to evangelize the world. Uh, he offers that, uh, he tells a story of one man by the name William Carey, a poor English shoemaker born in 1761. After his conversion at age 18, he began preaching in some small Baptist chapel, supporting himself by his trade. While William Carey read Captain Cook's voyage, sparkled his interest into foreign missions, and he continued to study the Bible, and as he continued to study the Bible, he became convinced that the central responsibility of the church should be foreign missions. That this is probably does not sound very radical to you today, but in Carey's days, it was revolutionary. The prevailing hyper-Calvinist view of his time was that the Great Commission had been given only to the apostles. It had been fulfilled in previous years. The heathen had rejected the gospel, and so they would have to wait their fate on Judgment Day. But Curry, who was a Calvinist, dared to ask whether Jesus' command to make disciples of all nations was not obligatory on all Christians. An old minister accused him of being miserably enthusiastic, a miserable enthusiast, when he shared his, this idea at a minister's gathering one pastor retorted, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without, you, without your aid and mine. When Kare actually proposed going himself to India as a missionary, his father exclaimed, is William mad? But William Kare went to India, where he labored for 40 years. He supervised and edited translation of the Bible into at least 36 languages. He published grammar and dictionaries, labored to abolish window burning and infanticides, and studied botany to promote agricultural improvement. In a sermon that he preached before he left England, Kerry, uttered his newfound words, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. He is often called the father of modern mission. At the passage that we consider today is bordering on a mission. I have given it the title from Jerusalem to Gaza because on that road from Jerusalem to Gaza, God was on mission rescue for one man, the Ethiopian eunuch. I think now you're beginning to put the dots together. God on mission on the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And uh, probably you would have liked this sermon to be entitled, God, Philip, Sheep and God, and the Ethiopian eunuch. But suffice it that we call it today from Jerusalem to Gaza. The Bible opens this portion of the scripture that is for our consideration today by saying, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Gaza. This is desert. There are many ways that God communicates to us. He does it personally through himself in the person of the Father and sometimes through the person of God the Son and through the person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And he sometimes uses 
angels who are celestial beings, which the writer to the book of Hebrews will say they are ministering spirits for those who are to inherit eternal life. And sometimes he uses human beings and sends them. Sometimes he uses the word that is printed, the printed pages. And he does communicate and reach out to us through dreams and visions and even through the book of nature. But in our case of our consideration this morning, the Bible says that it was through an angel. There are several portions in the scripture where God used angels to reach out to humanity, to communicate to humanity. The Bible says one day in the book of Genesis chapter 18, while Abraham was seated outside his tent, he saw three men passing. And he reached out to them and asked them, my lords, if you don't mind, allow me to have you come into my tent, that I may bring water and that you may wash your feet and I lay a table before you. Then the story changes into that these men were not just men. You begin to hear, and the Lord spoke to Abraham. There were three men, and one of them was the Lord. As you continue down in the story and you get to chapter 19, uh, one of the three men remains talking with Abraham, and the two proceed on to come to Sodom and Gomorrah. And when they reach Sodom and Gomorrah, they cease to be men and they become angels. So they were angels. We find accounts like these ones in the Bible about angels visiting with men. In the book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 12, uh, we find an, an angel visiting one man by the name Gideon and asking him to be instrumental in the salvation of the children of Israel from the oppression of the Midianites. Uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20, an angel came to Joseph when he was about to dump Mary on understanding that Mary was expectant when he was planning to marry her. But an angel came to him and told him, don't, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. You can go on and on and on. You will see how angels operate in human lives. One day, Peter and some of the disciples are arrested and they are put behind bars in the book of Acts chapter 5 and verse 19. An angel of the Lord came into that prison and freed them. The leaders of the church, the priests, the, the scribes, the Pharisees who had put them in prison on coming to look for them in the prison, they couldn't find him, couldn't find them because they had been freed by angels. Now the Bible in this portion tells us that an angel of the Lord uh, spoke to Philip saying, arise and go. In short, angels are celestial beings that communicate a use of God to bring information to humanity. It was therefore heaven itself reaching out to Philip and asking Philip to go on a mission assignment. And this is what the angel said. Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Really my real reason for choosing this topic of from Jerusalem to Gaza was because I am aware there, that whereas you and me, who love to read the Bible and who esteem the Bible very highly, do it so and believe in the Bible, is not everybody in the world who believes, that, who believes in the Bible and who takes the Bible as being an authentic book. Sometimes those who do not believe in the Bible consider it to be fictitious. Uh, they con some consider it to be simple fables, stories that are told. But allow me to observe that the Bible, going by what we find in this verse, this first verse of our portion of consideration, that the angel spoke to Philip, saying to him, go towards 
south along the road which goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Allow me to observe that the Bible is a book that talks about real places and the real people. If there was any doubt about the authenticity of the Bible and whether the Bible is not just fiction, uh, please rest assured that the Bible is a true book that talks about true people and also talks about true places. As we speak right now, we know that there is a place called Jerusalem and there's a place called Gaza. The Bible should be taken as a true book that, and that it is not fictitious. It is not about stories to make people happy, but it is a real book talking about real things that really happened and the real people involved and real places involved. So he tells Philip, go towards south, along the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. You will be happy to know that uh, Philip was in Samaria. Chapter 8 begins by saying that Philip was in Samaria following the persecution that had come to the church. The believers, the disciples scattered and went various places. And one of those places they went was Samaria. For Jesus had told the disciples just before he left that you will receive the promise of the Father. And when the promise of the Father comes upon you, you will become my witnesses. And please begin in Jerusalem, then you proceed on to Judea, and then you go to Samaria, and then you go to the rest of the world. The gospel had done so far so well in Jerusalem and in Judea, and went further now to Samaria. And in Samaria, success was attending Philip's mission. The Bible says... Uh, allow me to read together with us chapter 8 and uh, beginning from uh, verse 14. The Bible says, Now when the apostles who were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word, they said to Peter and John to go to them who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, John and Peter, Peter and John, had sent to Samaria following a successful mission of uh, Philip in this particular place. Verse 4, in particular, to give, us, to give us the perspective, says, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitude, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. There was great joy in the city. Philip was so successful that many people heeded the word preached by him. And uh, there were miracles that attended his ministry in Samaria. So, so much that even those ones who practiced sorcery uh, became believers. Uh, verse 9 says, But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria charming that he was someone great, to whom they gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is great power of God. They, and they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men, men and women were baptized. Simon himself also believed, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done by Philip. So Philip, whom God is telling, arise and go. 
is a successful evangelist. His mission in Samaria is flourishing. And suddenly God interrupts his successful mission in Samaria and asks him to leave and go for an assignment on the road towards it. He tells him, go, arise and go towards south and get to the road that moves from, uh, the, get to the road that moves from Jerusalem to Gaza. The Lord will have us know that whereas uh, Philip would have wanted to settle in Samaria because of the success that his mission assignment was receiving, God will have him know that it is not settling time yet. As long as there's still one soul that is still outside the fold of safety of God, it is time to proceed on on mission. And so he says this mission is well completed now in Samaria. It is time to move. A success of mission in one place is simply an introduction to mission to, uh, in another place. We must keep on moving. God is telling Philip that keep on moving, keep on moving on mission. Mission must keep on going on and on and on as long as there are people who have not been saved yet. We have to keep on moving on mission, going on mission, rescue uh, people from the bondage of sin and come there, bring them to the safety that is found in Jesus Christ. So Philip's mission is interrupted and he has to leave and go to meet this person, that, to go to this assignment that he does not know anything about. The fact that we were successful yesterday in mission in another place, in a particular place, is simply reason enough to have us move to the next mission assignment. So Philip has to move. And so Philip moved, and the Bible says in the next verse that follows, so he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, and who was in charge of all her treasury. The description here is not for nothing. God is calling upon Philip to go, and as Philip arrives on this road, shortly as he gets on this road that is from Jerusalem to Gaza, he meets a man. He notices there is a man, and uh, he realizes that this man is but an Ethiopian. And the description is telling us that he was a eunuch. This description is to give uh, what you will consider to be impediments. If Philip was honest with what the Jews, what the Israelites had been perpetrating for a long time, he would not want to be engaged in this assignment. Why? Because whereas God had picked on Israel to be the people he will use to reach the world, they had struggled with this request and desire of God upon them. They had struggled a lot with, with it. When Jesus himself is sending out his disciples in the book of Matthew chapter 10, uh, probably uh, Philip, knowing that reality, Jesus had said, go to the lost sheep of Israel. Make sure that you don't go to the Samaritan. Read with me the book of Matthew chapter. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 5. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the city of Samaria, uh, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This was the initial time Jesus sent out the disciples. 
And it could be, it could, it could be that it was informed by their understanding which was still, uh, which still had the struggles with reaching out to people who were non-Jews. And Jesus therefore started them on this path. Just start with the Israelites first. All of us know that Jews struggled a lot to reach out. One day, one day Jesus is visited with a woman of Tyre and Sidon uh, who had her daughter suffering from demonic obsession and she requested that Jesus would come to assistance. And Jesus saying something that was con consistent with the understanding of the Jews at that time, he says, uh, it is not proper that I should give food for the children, food meant for the children to the dogs. Meaning that his coming uh, was not for the people who are non-Jews. In fact, he says, I was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. And therefore, meaning that this lady did not deserve to receive attention from Jesus Christ. But the woman said, but even the puppies help themselves from the cramps that fall from the master's table. Probably Philip with this kind of mindset in him, he would have been reluctant to move in and minister uh, to the Ethiopian eunuch. But Philip has since overcome this problem and he knows that the gospel dispensation, the requirement to reach out to people, the need to bring people to the fold of God of safety is to be taken to everybody in the world. No wonder he had already gone to Samaria. And he now, God having seen him having been in Samaria and succeeded successfully, he can confidently bring Philip to this assignment. Sometimes, brothers and sisters, as human beings, we have our own limitations of putting ourselves into groups and uh, practicing partisan sim and uh, practicing exclusivity. Uh, we are not the first ones to do this. It happened with the Jews. But God will want to let us know in this story that we consider today that he has no, he does not entertain exclusivity as far as matters mission is concerned. And mission is to go to everyone and so he encourages Philip to get to minister to this Ethiopian eunuch. Jesus himself in, in the book of Acts, while giving his disciples marching orders and the great commission, he tells them, when you receive the promise of the Father, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the rest of the world. Look who is the author of the book of Acts. In this portion, he begins to let us know that now what Jesus had said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, is, is coming to fulfillment. No wonder Philip is now moving from Samaria to the rest of the world. I hear God speaking to all of us and saying that it is the gospel is to be preached to everyone and no one is to be excluded. No one is to be left out, no one is to be discriminated against. It should reach everyone. As long as there is one who hasn't believed, we have to keep on moving and reaching out to those who are still outside the safety of the fold of God. Philip moves and he gets an Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopians were despicable people according to the Jews earlier. And you can read that from the book of Deuteronomy. And this particular Ethiopia will even be more despicable in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6. Uh, he would say somebody who was even uh, a eunuch should not be entertained uh, closer to the sanctuary. They should be kept out. But this is the person Philip is being sent to. Uh, simply, God means that everybody is to be brought closer. 
in the book of Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 3. Uh, Philip is working in the interest of that verse, of that portion of the scripture that tells of how the gospel is to be moved to the rest of the world. Uh, Isaiah 56, Isaiah 56, and uh, uh, beginning from verse number one, it says, Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of a foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry, a, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, No, these statements mean everything. Let not the eunuch say that I am a dry tree. Uh, they are all invited to the, the family of God. Thus says the Lord to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath and who chooses what pleases me and who holds fast my covenant. Even to them I will give my house, I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Um, Philip, being studious of the word of God, as we will see in the next verse, uh, must have understood this and was comfortable to reach out to the Ethiopian eunuch even when he realized that he was an Ethiopian and, and a eunuch as he would describe. He was comfortable to go. Being moved therefore as he reaches the Ethiopian eunuch, the Bible says, uh, the spirit in verse 19 says, say to Philip, go near and uh, overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and had him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? The spirit, now it's not the angel anymore in verse 26. It says, the spirit said to Philip, I say to Philip, move closer to this person. And Philip did not just move closer. The Bible says he ran to the man. And as he got to the chariot, he heard the man reading aloud. Probably he was reading in the hearing of the people who were traveling together with him. And he asked the man, do you understand what you are reading? And the man says, how can I unless someone guts me? The Bible, in this portion of the scripture, will let us know that it is not enough that we read the word of God. It is necessary that we understand the word of God. And so Philip asked him, are you understanding? Probably you may not appreciate the need to understand. But if we do not understand, the word will not be helpful. And it is in this word, this word that is the agent of God for salvation. The word of God is the, his agent for salvation. So it is by hearing the word and reading of the word of God that faith is developed. But to develop that faith, one requires to understand. Jesus, in the book of Matthew chapter 13 and verse 19, did say this one day when, when he was giving a parable about a sower. He said, a sower went to sow and some seed fell along the road and they were picked by the birds of the air. Others fell among thorns. They sprouted and they were choked by the thorns. They were not fruitful. Others fell along a rock and they sprouted, but they didn't have a place to take the roots. So they withered. It's only one type of seed that fell in good ground. And then in the explanation, verse, verse, verse 9, verse 19 of chapter 13, he says, the one that fell along the road and that was picked by the birds of the air represents those people who hear the word of God but don't get to understand it. It is significant that we understand the word of God because the word of God is, the, is God's agent for our salvation. 
And when it is not understood, then we lose out. We don't develop faith. In the book of uh, Matthew chapter 25, reigning or giving emphasis to the need to understand Matthew chapter 25 and verse 29, uh, you can read together with me, uh, Matthew chapter 25, uh, Jesus, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 29, Jesus is telling a parable, and in this parable, he makes an expression that lends understanding and, and helps us to appreciate the need to understand. Verse 29 says, for to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abandoned but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Uh, Jesus was giving a parable, of course, of talents. And he says, the one who had one talent but did not put it to use, uh, lost it. And uh, it was given to the one who had much. Jesus saying that when we have, but it is not appreciated. When we hear the word and we don't understand, we don't put more effort to understand, then it is even taken away from us. As he will say that the seed was taken away by the bird, representing the people who hear the word and do not understand it. Or probably, to be put in a better way, the Bible in the book of Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, verse 11 to 12, uh, the apostle uh, Luke writing about the church that was, was in Berea, he says these people were keen to follow the word of God. They did not just hear, but they took time to be able to follow with it, to understand whether the things that they heard uh, were actually the real one. Friends, it is significant that uh, we understand the word of God. I am delighted and I'm happy to see many of you coming to the house of God to, to, to be blessed by the word of God. And the word of God will let us know that it is important that this word that we hear, we get to understand it because it is in the understanding that it will be helpful to us. Uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter, in, uh, in Matthew, in Matthew, uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 10 will say the same thing, the need to understand. In the book of Luke, Chapter 25 and verse 44, he says, do you understand? It is important to understand. So Philip asks the man, do you understand? Because it is important that it is the word in us is understood. The man says, how can I? He's a humble man. He's admitting that he can't understand without help. And he even goes ahead to invite Philip to come into his chariot to explain to him. And Philip joyfully comes into the chariot and the Bible says, verse 35, that opening his mouth and beginning at the scripture, preached Jesus to him. Philip, listen to me, children of God. The Bible says, opening his mouth, Philip, starting from this scripture, giving us an impression that Philip went through several portions of the scripture to preach Jesus to the Ethiopian eunuch. A similar expression will be seen uh, also Jesus using this style of making people to understand the word of God. Come with me in the book of Luke chapter 24, quickly. The book of Luke chapter 24 and the verse number 44. Jesus had just resurrected and he was gathered in the upper room with the disciples who had been struggling to understand the word of God. And Jesus starts them out to help them to understand the word of God. The Bible says, then, said, then he said to them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and concerning and in the Psalms concerning me. In other words, Jesus lets us know that to help the disciples to understand the things about him, he had to take them through the word of God as it was written in the law of Moses, in the prophets, and in the Psalms to bring them to understanding. And uh, uh, so Philip is not the only one who will take this route of getting a systematic study that will run from 
the law from the Old Testament, the uh, Pentateuch, to the prophets, to the, to the Psalms, and to the prophets, uh, Jesus also did the same. And please appreciate also, uh, come with me to the book of Acts. We see Paul taking the same route. I say this because there are many of us who have an opportunity to study the word of God with people, but they do not know how to go about it. In the portions of the scripture that we read here, how Philip did it, and how Jesus did it, and how Paul will do it, we are learned a methodology on how to go about it. Uh, read with me the book of Acts chapter number 28. Uh, the book of Acts chapter number 28. And uh, uh, Paul is arrested. He's in Rome. He's arrested in a house arrest. And Paul is about, uh, there are people who come to hear him. They want to understand. And verse 23 says, So when they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them and concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets, and from morning till evening. Paul's style, Jesus' style, and Philip's style, Mary, they are the same. That in matters helping people to understand the will of God and God's mission, rescue mission, we will need to brush through the Old Testament, the Psalms, the prophets, and now we have the New Testament to be able to bring them to understanding. And I hear, therefore, as Philip is beginning to explain to, to, to Theopan, he says, look, the place where I've uh, the Ethiopian eunuch was, was, was reading was in the book of Isaiah chapter uh, 53, verse 7 to 8, uh, talking about the sheep and the lamb, like a sheep is escorted to the slaughter, and as a lamb is dumb before its sharer. So it's about sheep and lamb, and Philip gathers that it's about the sacrificial plan, the plan of God of salvation in the sacrificing of sheep and lamb. So he says, look, when man fell in sin, God has been on mission all this while. Mission to rescue humanity. He came to Adam in the garden and he told him, look, you have already sinned and your way out of this predicament is you will slaughter a lamb. And so Adam begins slaughtering a lamb, a symbol of the lamb of God that will come many years to die for the sins of humanity. You, a symbol of the lamb that you'll find talked about in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 that says a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So Philip starts him on this, on this assignment, on this study of the lamb. This lamb, Adam will tell his children, uh, Cain and Abel, and they begin also to make sacrifices. Abel will accept this plan and offer a lamb. Cain will refuse the, the plan of salvation through sacrificing a lamb. And he will come and tell, he talk about Abraham, who, whom God called and uh, uh, to demonstrate this, the, the plan of salvation, he says, he told Abraham, look, there is a lamb in the thicket. Don't kill your son. So humanity is not to be killed. There's a lamb that will die in place of humanity. That lamb is Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew chapter 1 and verse 19. Uh, John the Baptist will say, behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And Philip rests and say, whoever believes in this lamb is saved. Whoever believes in this lamb is saved. Friends, it's not everybody who accepts the plan of God of salvation. Humanity, when humanity sinned in the Garden of Eden, all of us fell in sin. And we only have a way to salvation through believing in the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And the Ethiopian eunuch said, probably Philip had told him that uh, Jesus had told them, Go preach, and whoever believes shall be baptized. And so he asked Philip, I can see water. What hinders me from being baptized? And uh, Philip says, if you believe in your heart, if you believe with all your heart, why should I not baptize you? The Ethiopian eunuch believed. People are taking position from Adam to the end of this world to believe in the lamp or not to believe in the lamp. The Ethiopian eunuch 
believed in the Lamb, and he was baptized. The opportunity is given to you. I like Philip. He did not push the Ethiopian eunuch. He simply delivered the word and he left the Ethiopian eunuch to decide. The Ethiopian eunuch says, I believe. Who will say together with me that the plan of God of salvation that is made possible for you and me in the Lamb of God, you also believe in that plan and you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let me see by a show of hand. Those who also believe like Philip believed in the Lamb, let me see you by a show of hand. God has been on mission rescue. From the day Adam and Eve fell in sin, he is on that mission to rescue and me. And his plan is simple, to believe in the Lamb. A Lamb was slain. Plan of salvation was put in place even before man fell in sin because God in his omniscience already saw man falling in sin. And God put in place that plan to be saved through the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And the Ethiopian eunuch believed. Who believes together with me, together with the Ethiopian eunuch? I believe in the Lamb of God. I believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. If this is your, your conviction, will you stand up as we pray together? Loving Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because you do not leave us alone. You started out on mission, and you are intentional on saving us. We thank you for the plan of salvation of being saved through the Lamb. Like the Ethiopian eunuch believed in the Lamb, believed in Jesus Christ, we also stand on our feet to declare that we believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. Keep us in this conviction the rest of our life. In Jesus' name we pray.